Life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello, everyone. Hello. Today, we are going to be having a little bit of a conversation about all the stuff that we've been shoving in our eyes that have been streaming off of the internet. That sounds painful. It does sound painful, but I mean, when you think about it, you have this huge box that just streams radiation at your face, and you're just soaking it up. And on a more positive note, we're basically talking about things that we have been watching. We're also going to be talking about a few things we've been eating, mm -hmm. and one thing that we are both playing and maybe putting on our face or at least your face you know stay tuned if you want to know about that <laughs> yeah this is gonna be a fun episode I think. it is so what are you drinking so today i am drinking a bang blue raz flavored for those of you who haven't watched our youtube channels bang is one of our favorite drinks for getting energy into our bodies when we desperately desperately need it without having a crash later on and i desperately desperately needed it what are you drinking? I am drinking an iced coffee with sugar-free caramel syrup from Wawa. Well, actually, I got you a cold brew because if you get just an iced coffee, you have to use a signature blend. And that's why you weren't finding the sugar-free caramel. Oh, interesting. So I did it as a cold brew with sugar-free caramel. So basically what happens is on the weekends, none of us cook. What we usually do is we will get breakfast out at one of our different places around here, Wawa Wendy's. Kiki's, Panera, one of those places. We'll put it in order and then Marshall will go and pick it up while I get all this other work done. Fun fact though, while we're talking about what we're drinking, he and I both have actually gotten the three months unlimited coffee mm -hmm. from Panera. And basically you spend like nine bucks a month and you get coffee whenever you want. And I wasn't really sure how much I would really partake of this, but... I have found that I have gotten this coffee like maybe three times a week since we started this. Mm -hmm. My husband likes to go walking before the mall opens because it's air conditioning in there. And the Panera is on the outskirts of the mall. So he'll just drop by and get me my yeah. free coffee in the morning. And I think it's totally paying for itself. Yeah, for you, it definitely works out. For me, like I'll, I'll typically have it like once, maybe twice a week. Mm -hmm. And it still feels like it's worth it because you're getting an iced coffee, and you know you can get it at different sizes. When you, whenever you do something that is more than the value that they want to give you, you just pay a little extra. So I get a large version of it, and it's just fifty cents more. Mm -hmm. Yay! Yeah, it's 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 a pretty good deal. So if you yeah. have Panera in your area and you like coffee, definitely consider mm -hmm. this is a good deal. Yeah. And then, of course, while we're on the subject of food, let's talk about some things that we have discovered recently. Yeah. So uh, after the whole uh, pandemic debacle, uh, delivery apocalypse, uh, food has changed in the world. It has. Food has really changed. And a lot of places have to start thinking about delivery and pickup options. And those places that relied entirely on that before now had to up their game. And, you know, I do want to bring up before we go into what we've been talking about is the fact that a lot of the places around us, like very major franchises have closed. And we live in an area that is, you know, it's pretty busy. It's touristy, you know, because we live in Orlando and we're very close to Universal. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there it's a market for a lot of people to be here and to be able to eat these things. But we have had things closing that we never thought would be closing yeah. that are that are eating establishments and and i'm wondering part of me is wondering i mean they're on grubhub i know i've seen them on grubhub you know bite squad all those uber eats but i'm wondering if part of it isn't because of the fact that people are just not eating out as much and they're not getting delivery as much because of delivery fees yeah i have noticed that a lot of the places that we like to get delivered are directly from the establishment rather yes. than using the delivery services because of all of the fees. So I wonder if that kind of played into it a little bit. I think it really did because a lot of people got very used to using Grubhub delivery services, kind of like that. And a lot of restaurants relied on those so that they wouldn't have to pay drivers. And that right. meant that when... 
people no longer could afford the extra fees to have things delivered for them, they didn't want to do delivery anymore. And that's not to say that for us, we stopped patronizing these places. We yeah. actually didn't. We would always get like pickup or one of us would go and like just order and pick it up and take it to go. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like we stopped going to these places, but we uh, just, I guess maybe liked to, you know, every once in a while, we would really like to get it delivered. Yeah. Which is why pizza is kind of popular, I guess. Yeah. And so speaking of pizza, one of our one of our problems is finding a good pizza place. Yeah. We had one that was really good. It was called Marco's. It was kind of more of a local franchise. It, there were a couple locations, but mm -hmm. I had never heard of it before I came to Florida. Yeah. And it back when we were living with our folks across town, we would always go to this Marco's because it was right around the corner. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a Marco's in this particular area that, that right. delivers to us. Exactly. Yeah. And so we kept on having to go around to different places and... And it was never satisfying or it was too expensive. Mm -hmm. The best pizza in the area is our BJ's pizza. But on a whim, we're like, you know what? Let's see if Little Caesars got any better. Yeah. Because we always didn't really like their stuff before. But who knows? Maybe they changed. Maybe they're like, because they're still around. Maybe and there is a Little Caesars that's legitimately around the corner. Yeah. Around the block, really, from our, our house. It takes like five minutes to get there it's yeah. so easy and I, we never really paid attention like every time we drove by um we would be like oh little caesars Wah. and then just kept going because we didn't think we liked it and then we got some very recently and it was actually really enjoyable better than we thought we especially like the deep deep is mm. what i think it's called the you know the deep dish pan pizza which is a little more pricey i think it's like 15 bucks for one yeah. but it's big it feeds quite a few people and it's just exactly what i want a crust to be it's kind of like that crispy edges mm -hmm. and but doughy center like it's exactly what i want a pizza to be but I also have to say that I think their delivery method is kind of genius, really. Um, there are a couple things I think they need to improve upon that are just totally small, minute, logistical things. But this is how it works, and I think it's fun. So they do delivery, but they also do pickup. And the way they do pickup is you order either online or through their app, and they send you a QR code and a digit number, and they say your pizza is going to be ready in these portals it could be one, it could be two, depends on how many pizzas you get. So then you go to pick up your pizza, They it scans your QR code, and the doors open to your portals so that you can pick up your pizza. So so it's kind of like one of those automats in yes, the old style. Yes, exactly. That's so brilliant. Now, if there is something you do, you still have to figure out, do you have everything? When we got pizza on Friday night, you know, I put in the order, but I didn't really tell my husband, okay, this is everything you need. I did send, I usually send screenshots of the order so they know. So if something happened, he went to go pick it up and he came back with two pizzas and I was like, wait, we're missing like two other things, you know, because we had a friend over. So, you know, there was like four of us. We, were like, mm -hmm. we eat crazy bread, whatever. And he he was like, what? So he went back to the store and apparently they forgot to put it in his portals, the other two. So the manager knew exactly when he came back in. He was like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And, you know, here's your pizzas and your crazy bread and some sauce. And, you know, it was cool. Like at least, but, you know, still there's that human error side of it that doesn't, you know. Yeah, you're never going to get rid of that. Right, exactly. So I just thought it was so unique and now we're probably back on the Little Caesars train. I think the only thing that I'm a little kind of like, meh, about is that they do charge you for sauce. Yeah, and they, they charge you quite a bit more for sauce than I really expected. So we always have pizza sauce in our pantry anyway, so we yeah. just use our own. You know, back in the days when I actually had the time to make my pizza dough, it takes all day. Yeah. Basically, I haven't done it in a while and I need to, but we, mm -hmm. we used to make our own pizza. Yep. So the second thing we've been shoving in our face mm -hmm. is one I found actually just last night. We had this morning. We have a Krispy Kreme around the corner from our house and they came out with this thing called mini desserts and they're only running it through the end of January. So you don't have very long to grab yourself some of these. Correct. They are mini donuts. They're probably, I would say, about half the size of a regular donut. Yeah. Still has the donut holes and it, it's essentially a glazed donut. And then they put stuff on top of it uh, for the different flavors. So you can get birthday cake, chocolate chip cookie dough, 
lemon bar, strawberry cheesecake, and if you get the big one that's like 16 donuts, they also include just regular glazed. So we got this one that was like a mini box and it's basically just one of each of the four flavors. And we did a little taste test this morning. Uh, what yes. is your favorite flavor? I'm gonna have to say it was the chocolate chip. Even though they say it's a chocolate chip cookie dough, they included this kind of a frosting on there that was like German chocolate. And they kind of drizzled it on top of the chocolate glaze that they already yeah. have. And then they have some like chocolate chips that are sprinkled on top. And they're teeny tiny chocolate chips Very, too. The minis for the mini. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, that was my favorite. So my favorite really was, um, I think, the lemon bar. It had, it was very much just like a, a very thick lemon glaze on top of the donut. And it was just the right kind of combination of tart and sweetness. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, sometimes lemon stuff goes hit or miss for me. Yeah. But I think this was very good. I, it was a very excellent donut. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not think that any of these were bad. The best ones were, yeah, chocolate. Lemon was a great one. Mm -hmm. The birthday cake was very sweet and very birthday cake. Probably was all of our least favorite. Yeah. But that's not saying it was bad. It was just the least of them. And the cheesecake one was a little understated, which was mm -hmm. good when you have these powerful flavors alongside them. Right. So you had like a kind of a drizzle on top of the strawberry glaze. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they had like dollops some cheesecake frosting, I think, which yeah. made the cheesecake flavor. But it was good as well. Um, just not as good. I think, yeah, lemon and chocolate, I think, were both the best. Yeah. The best two. Um, so if you're, you have a Krispy Kreme near you and you want to give it a try, you have until the end of January. And I think it was just kind of a fun thing to try out. It was super out. fun. Uh, we, we all shared it between the three of us. We had sat there, cut it up into thirds, and that was that was a challenge. <laughs> yes, it was. Let's just talk about ColourPop v Animal Crossing. Okay, so if you guys haven't been playing Animal Crossing, you probably skipped over the worst year ever of the planet. Congratulations. But Animal Crossing has been a major part of our home. When it first came out, Lainey was the one that had it, and I was helping her organize her island. I had gone into Photoshop, and I was modeling her island in Photoshop to help her lay it out. It was fun. Mm -hmm. But now I've got my own island called Labrina, and I'm just still getting started, it feels like. I've, I've got only two stars out of five. And that makes right. me sad. Well, that's okay. Like I said, I got it. Like the day it came out, mm -hmm. I bought this game. I had New Leaf before this game came out for my DS. So, you know, I knew how Animal Crossing worked and I knew it was a game I wanted to play. So I have a good, what, seven, eight months mm -hmm. ahead of him. But I guess it works out because I can just drop whatever <laughs> yeah. he needs. Like he's like, I'm looking for this item. Got it. No, no worries there. And and because of that, I'm I've got three or four of my fossils left to find, mm -hmm. and then my my fossil side of museums done. Right, it's like so I can pass all those on to them. Yeah. yeah. So when I found out that ColourPop, which is besides Pretties for Your Face, ColourPop is my favorite makeup brand. I should mm -hmm. say non indie, even though they are classified as indie, I don't consider them indie anymore because they're so mainstream. And they are coming out with this collaboration that I am so excited for. But deep down in my heart, I have this feeling I'm not going to get any of it because it's going to be worse than the Hocus Pocus collab, of which I couldn't get the lipstick I wanted. However, I will say that when they had the Mandalorian Baby Yoda palette, that did come back into stock after it sold out. So there's always hope that this will come back. So when you're saying worse, you're saying just how quickly it's going to go out of stock. Oh, it's going to go out of stock so bad. Yeah. So bad. But let us let me tell you what is included and then some nice little extras like you okay. can do. The entire collection is coming out January, that's this month, 28th, that's this Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Woot. And for those of you here on the East Coast, that's 1 p.m. I usually do set an alarm and about 12.55, I'm hovering in my browser waiting for everything to go live. The items that you can get are actually pretty pretty fun. There are palettes that are $12. There's a lip tint duos. There's three of those that are $12. The blushes are also $12. And then it looks like the Super Shock Shadow is $7 and the Glitterly Obsessed is $10. 
So it's a wide range. If you want to get the entire collection, it's $125, uh, which technically is not that horrible for um, all of these products. Yeah. So there are four palettes. One of them is kind of a green, blue color themed. It looks like it has, just from the pictures on their Instagram, it has like one matte and like a shimmer, maybe two shimmers and a glitter. And I'm not a big fan of their glitter when it comes to their pressed shadows. I'm so... Legitimately, I probably would be buying this for the packaging and the three other shadows and not one, but you know, for the price, it's pretty cheap. Like I said, the green one is called Nook Ink and it is themed after Tom Nook and the Timmy and Tommy, Timmy and Tommy what I call the trash pandas, but I love them. They're adorbs. There is one called Five Star Island Palette that is based in upon Isabel and mm-hmm. so cute. The colors are more of like some peaches and a couple burgundies and a, like it looks like a gold tint. Then there's one called What a Hoot, which is Celeste and Blathers. It is like oranges and browns. And then the one that I love the best and I would probably get is La Bella the Ball, which is themed after all three Abel sisters, Mm -hmm. Mabel, Sable, and La Belle, or Label, however you want to say it. It's La Belle. And it is purples. And of course, I would love that one for sure. There are two blushes. One looks kind of orange and one looks kind of pink. I would totally get the pink one. It is called Flower Power. There are three different tint duos. There's one that's like two, a pink and a red. And I think it's called a fruit basket duo because they're both named after fruit. So those are the three things that I would actually get from this collection if I am lucky enough to do it. But they also have that glitter that was up in the top right of that picture. Right. So that's what's called a glitterly obsessed. It's kind of like a glitter gel Mm -hmm. for your eyes. My eyes don't like glitter. I always end up getting it like stuck in my eyes and my contact lenses and other things. The Super Shock Shadow though, it's called Balloon Pop. (laughs) I think that's funny. (laughs) But what I don't understand is it's totally not the color of any balloon that you (laughs) you would be getting. (laughs) But that's fine. It's like a brownish color and it looks nice. It looks like there might be glitter in that too. And so I'm Again, not very Mm -hmm. interested. Okay, so here's some stuff for those of you who don't wear makeup. Although I was laughing because I was watching a Switch Force video last night. He does a lot of like Let's Plays and a lot of Animal Crossing content. And he was showing some things about ColourPop, which I will tell you in a minute. And he was like, I'm a guy, but I will totally do this. ColourPop, send me a palette. I'll put it on my face. I don't even care. And I was laughing so hard because he was so excited about it. But basically, ColourPop has set up their own... Own Animal Crossing Island that mm-hmm. you can go and visit. I did go visit it this morning and I'm going to put some pictures of that on my Instagram for you. But I will also leave the Dream Island code down in the description box so that you can go visit it yourself. There is a whole section outside of their Able Sisters shop that has the palettes and then there's some designs for clothes. Because it's a Dream Island, you can't go into their Able Sisters to get that. However, if you go onto their YouTube channel, There is in their own Dream Island Tour video, it says if you go to their Pinterest page, you can get the design codes for things. So I went to their Pinterest page and I cannot find them. And I'm not the only one because there are tons of comments on the video that were like, where are these design codes? So I don't know. I really want some of those ColourPop dresses. I think that'd be super fun. But if anyone finds them, please let me know because I I want to find. Hopefully they'll post it later. (laughs) Yeah. And even then, like, I think it'd be really cool for them to keep on putting up other things like actual makeup that your character could Mm -hmm. wear, stuff like that. That would be so much fun. Yeah. I don't know who did this island, like who who was working for them that did this island, but it is so fun looking and this person Mm -hmm. must have had a blast doing it. It was so well designed. In fact, I have heard that if you go to Nintendo's Dream Island, it sucks. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I really want to go see it for myself, but I Well, really what I'm kind of looking forward to is that this year is the 35th anniversary of Zelda. Oh wow. And for the 35th anniversary of Mario, they did a whole bunch of stuff that was very limited edition. So I'm kind of looking forward to see if maybe they'll do something in Animal Crossing for Zelda. That would be amazing. Because I would totally run around dressed as Link. Mhm. I just think that the collaborations the Animal Crossing do actually do are kind of awesome they and i are. hope they continue to do that because it there's just such a creative outlet of, of playing mm-hmm. animal crossing like even if you aren't in big into video games i know so many people that just got the switch for this game just so that they could play it and have some kind of outlet. one of my co-workers that was why they got mm-hmm. it 
If you guys are looking for or you want to see our islands, we will leave our design codes down below as well for you so that you can do Dream Island and come and visit us. Dream please Island please ways. don't don't judge Labrina. It's not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> and mine is always a work in progress. <laughs> Although you've got some really fun stuff. Going yeah, and on. I'm not going to lie. A lot of my island design is very heavily influenced by what I see online. So I will see somebody post a picture of this is what they did to their island, and I will recreate it. So it's not totally original. Some of it is, but some of it is really not. So don't judge me for taking my interpretation from other people. Thank you so much. Oh, and if you do go to Labrina, stay out of the jail. You got you got some tarantulas in there or something? Some scorpions? No, just an evil spirit and a lantern. Okay, so now we're going to talk about things we've watched, and then if you go all the way to the end, you'll be able to hear about this month's Owl Crate, but I'll just put that out there so that in case you don't really care about Owl Crate, you can pop off before the end. But let's talk about what we've been watching. So what you watching? What am I what you watching? So the first thing that I finished was the FX series Pose. My husband has been bugging me to watch this series. And I'm a stubborn person, so I was just kind of like, I don't want to. Just because you're going to make me, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> but I uh, ended up watching it, and I ended up really liking it. Sometimes he knows me too well, and it makes me angry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that happens. Anyway, uh, so I, I actually really liked it. The, the story of Pose is it happens in, like, the late 80s and early 90s, especially in the midst of the AIDS epidemic when it became really mainstream mm-hmm. that it was happening and it was killing a lot of people that's kind of what this is about it's it's the ballrooms and the competitions i guess is a, is a okay word i mean they win trophies they have different themes and they walk the ballrooms with these different themes drag queens even people that aren't like it it's kind of open sometimes as to who can do it? And then it's also about these people's lives, how they're dealing with the fact that all their people that they know are dying from not only AIDS, but also just living on the streets, not mm-hmm. having anywhere to go. And it it's one of the reasons why houses, when you say, like, I come from the house of um, when you're in a drag queen family, it's one of the reasons why it became so important for them to join a family mm. was because the family could protect them, give them a place to stay so they're not living on the street, a place where they could run to when their own family maybe rejected their lifestyle. I think it's an important show. If you go into it saying, you know, I'm, I'm purely going to watch this for entertainment value, uh, prepare to be sidestriped with reality, <laughs> quite honestly, in, See, like, in an important way. The, the very little bit of it that I saw, because I saw you guys watching it and I kind of caught a snippet of it. I was like, this feels like it's supposed to be very glam, but it's going to get real, real fast. It does. It does. And get all real. I saw was a ballroom scene. Because I had watched RuPaul's Drag Race. I felt like I was familiar with what they were doing, but I feel like this show was just so much more in-depth and helped me understand the community a lot more, the culture Mm -hmm. of it all. There are, I believe, two seasons of it. They are going to do a third, and I'm really excited about where they're going in the third season because a lot of the people that were in the original house of Evangelista is what it's called, the main house the, 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 the main character starts and is after Linda Evangelista, the model. A lot of the people in her house have moved on to do things with their lives. And she is kind of befriending two very young kids that are about 14 years old that she found on the docks. And I think she's going to take them under their wing. And I'm really excited for how that's going to play out uh, for sure. So if you are interested, that show, I highly recommend it is not for everyone. Not mm-hmm. not a family friendly show at all. So don't don't go into that. <laughs> but but if you're the kind of person that's looking for shows that will broaden your horizons, you probably want to give it a shot. Correct. Yes. So very recently I've watched through the third season of Young Justice. I'd already watched the first two seasons of this animated show. It's it's about the sidekicks of superheroes from the DC world. And how they kind of grow up and become heroes in their own right. But the Young Justice group is kind of a covert team. They're not part of the Justice League, but they're still working for the Justice League. This season is all about how the world is now dealing with people with superpowers and not treating it very well by 
forcing people to have superpowers and then putting them into slavery. Oh, wow. These kids are now fighting against it and trying to use social media while the villains are fighting back with a social campaign of their own. So this is all about superheroes and supervillains and social media in between. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting story. I liked a lot of their take on classic characters. Young Justice is... One of those shows that seems on the surface to be like, yeah, this is an action show for kids. No, it's not. It gets dark very quickly. You know, if if you're probably later teen, you can go for it. Uh, It's on HBO Max. Okay, awesome. Yeah. A show that I just finished by myself is on Disney+. Plus. It is called On Point. Mm -hmm. They're, They're marketing it as a season at the American School of Ballet in New York. And I am not a huge fan of ballet, although I am of dance, so I do have a passing interest in it. I watched the first episode and was just really interested in these kids that are starting ballet at such a young age and thinking, are they, are, you know, are they going to exploit these children, like drive them into the ground and make them like, when you watch fame, for, like, yeah. for example, like you have dream, you want fame and, you know crush the kids <laughs> i i always was like is this really how how this is gonna go but it is not in fact it's more i would say of a supportive atmosphere of the, not only the people that you are growing up through the school of ballet with but also the teachers and the main process through this show is not only showing how their lives are but also they audition and go through doing the nutcracker oh, wow. with the american ballet company And they talk about Balanchine, who is the guy who basically set up the school and created the Nutcracker that we know, the ballet. And it's not one of my favorite ballets, to be honest. I I like the music, but I just sometimes get bored. However, after watching this, I think I have a renewed interest in it Mm -hmm. um, because I have an appreciation for what goes into it. When you go through the school of ballet, not only when you're like maybe preschool age, kindergarten age, the school of ballet will go to the public schools and hold not exactly hold auditions, but they're more like seminars or like recruitment classes where they will have the kids come into the room and they will have them stretch or they will have them do a certain position where they're looking at their body to see if they have a dancer's body and have the potential to be a ballet student. Then they will allow these lower income kids to come to the school under scholarship so that they can learn how to dance. And then you basically go through, like, I think while you're in the younger kids group, you have to live at home and you have to go to school. And then once you get into the older kids group, you stay on site at Lincoln Lincoln Center, I think is where they have all of their dorms. They have to go to school also. So a lot of them will take a ballet class, run over to this performing arts school and then come back and do more ballet. And then once they're done, while they're in their later years of the school of ballet, they can get tapped to be an apprentice for the American Ballet Company so that they then start to learn what it's like to be a professional dancer with the American Ballet Company and get paid to be a professional. So it kind of goes through this whole process. And as far as Nutcracker is concerned, the younger kids are allowed to do Nutcracker But all of the older roles are for people in the ballet company. So if you're in that advanced class of older kids, you don't do it anymore unless you get tapped to be an apprentice. They have to do, I think it's like 150 kids (laughs) to be in this performance. And it's dual cast. So they don't always perform. (laughs) Yeah, you want to trade off because it's physically grueling. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, I was especially like scared. I mean, having done theater, there is what they call, I think her name is Mother Ginger. She is wearing this huge dress and the dancer is on stilts and there are like 10 girls underneath her dress. So when you're watching this, all you see is these girls come running out underneath her dress and then they start dancing, right? But what you don't see is that they're underneath her dress and she has to walk sideways onto the stage on stilts. But she can't see them. And the kids are in the dark under the skirt. 
And so he, they all have to be coordinated in order for and, it to work. And not get stepped on, which they do. They do get stepped on. And even the people who are in charge of, like, organizing the dance is like, this is the worst. And every year it's the worst. And it, they don't have control over it because it's a ballet that they've been performing for Ever. decades. Yeah. And that's just how it's done. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're, you're describing this this whole thing. And yes, I'm a total nerd. So I'm looking at this whole ballet thing and seeing nothing more than the Jedi Order. That yes. they take these little kids. They're like, oh, hey, you have the midichlorian count. You can be one of us. Yes. And then you spend your entire life. And then you're separated from your family. You can never see them again. And you're just being a Jedi now. And then it kills you from the inside. So in this case, too, these kids go through two pairs of point shoes a week. At least two. So I'm wondering if it's the same for the lightsabers. And the very last thing I want to say about the show is that it ends right when quarantine happens. So the kids go to school and then they're told everyone needs to go home. Now, just go home. And then they start doing classes over Zoom. And it kind of shows a little bit of what happens there and how they're trying. And like people are like supposed to be graduating and stuff and they can't because of COVID. And that's where it stops. I think there was a lot more that was planned for the season. But they couldn't do it. That was a really smart way to end the season, though, because now you're like, uh, yeah. what's going to happen now? Yeah, what is going to happen? I wanted, like, I really wanted to see a lot of these people and what they were going to continue to do in the spring thing. But anyway, on point, Disney Plus. Check okay. it out. Let's talk about a show we both watched, which was okay. Discovery. Oh, yes. Let's talk about Discovery. We, we had watched the first two seasons, and the ending was kind of like, okay, cool. They're going to the future. Let's see what's happening. So they didn't just go a little bit to the future. They went a lot of it to the future till after Next Generation, after Voyager, mm-hmm. after Picard. Mm-hmm. And now we're in a galaxy that has faced the apocalypse of the burn. All dilithium of all warp-capable ships that were in warp at the time blew up. Mm-hmm. And the amount of dilithium left in the galaxy is very little. And I didn't really ever know this. I knew that I knew that dilithium actually wore out over time. Mm-hmm. But it seems like it's almost like a fuel source. It is, Because yeah. a small, like, they're saying, okay, well, this little small bit that you have here is going to take you this far. I'm like, how much dilithium was the Enterprise going through? Well, it might even be a, a commentary on the world and the fossil fuels and whatever. Oh, yeah. Even back then, because I know they talked about dilithium in the original series. So I know that this idea of the fuel has been happening for a long time. And it kind of is an interesting concept as to what happens when you run out of your dilithium crystals. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, they're going to have to f- deal with this. Mm-hmm. Now, what's great is that the Discovery doesn't actually need the lithium to get places. The Discovery can just teleport using shrooms. I still don't get how this works. Mm. But what I really love is this post-apocalyptic galaxy. Right. And how it feels and the new technology that they have in Trek, including mm. one that I think they need to start paying me for. Because I had this idea three years ago and that is their badges being holographic projectors <laughs> you guys all heard me as soon as they did that they're like dick, dick, this is my display i yelled out that's my idea <laughs> it's just attached to their badge they tap it they can do their console so you don't need a bridge anymore people can just be piloting the ship from the comfort of their home they can zoom it in correct there was one episode in particular that i think was so well oh done God. but the season as a whole I got bored toward the end. I'm not going to lie. I got a little bored. I get you. And the explanation of how the burn happens, which I will not say here, for those of you who still haven't seen it yet, their explanation is weak sauce to me. It is. Um, I feel I the do same. Not, I do not. I'm like, really? This is, this is what you're doing? And if this only happened once, technically, when you go back and think about it, it should have been happening a lot more because of the explanation that they gave. I honestly feel like it was a mistake to have answered the question of the burn in this season. Mm. They should not have done so. They should have made this, we have problems that are going on, let's fix all these problems, and that's this season. Right. Next season, let's deal with the burn and make it a much bigger story. Mm. But the character stories that they had in this 
were excellent, including a new character, mm-hmm. Adira. Yes. Who is a tr- well? She's, she's not hu- a trill. She's not a trill. She's a human. She's human with a trill symbiote in uh, her, which doesn't happen. Usually, you have to be trill mm-hmm. in order to have a trill symbiote. No, wait, not trill. Is there another species? The the trill are are two species. One is the trill host, which mm-hmm. is the humanoid with the freckles, mm-hmm. and then the other one is the trill symbiote. And Riker in Next Generation had actually had a trill symbiote in him for a brief period of time, but it rejected him. Oh, gotcha. And it had to go back into a trill host. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time that we've had a trill symbiote except a non-trill host. Gotcha. And That whole storyline was awesome. And I kind of wish that there were other parts of storylines that were the same as this. Mm Character-driven, you know, very, like, poignant, for lack of a better term, I guess. That has always been what Star Trek needs to be about. Mm -hmm. That's what made Star Trek different for me than Star Wars. It was character-driven. Exactly. And this... This series of Discovery is even more so. It isn't just, hey, these characters have lots of personality. It morphs over the length of the show. This show is driven entirely by their personalities, Mm -hmm. and I love it. And that also brings me to another thing, and that is Lower Decks. So also on CBS All Access, they started putting out an animated series called Star Trek Lower Decks, which focuses entirely on a group of ensigns on a ship that nobody really cares about called the Cerritos and it's all about what's going on when you aren't watching the bridge crew right they had one episode of this in next generation and it was my favorite one but this show the four main characters are pretty much the four different types of star trek fans and it's just it's so easy to connect with it's almost like you're watching futurama in star trek and the sheer number of Easter eggs and character-driven stuff that's going on here, beautiful. I did watch probably 15 minutes of it. Mm-hmm. Last night, Corey was watching it, and I was reading my book, and I would look up and watch every once in a while. It is... wow. Yes, it <laughs> Not is. Not what I expected. And the, the ending of the first season was epic. It was an epic ending, but it was all about the people. Mm. And that's what I loved about it. It was it was a really good show. And if you can stand animated shows, you should probably watch this. I would say, like, in feel, it's very similar to Simpsons, Bob's Burgers, like those mm-hmm. Fox animation shows. There is an edge to the show a yes. lot that the live Star Trek shows do not have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the animation quality is spectacular. It's really good. Yeah. So. And I don't really like animation, so... Yeah. Yeah. One show that we did finish also that we never really talked about was His Dark Materials. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. So we are now on season two, which is the Subtle Knife mm-hmm. season. And it's all about how Lyra and the boy, whose name I can't remember right <laughs> yeah. now, are trying to find the boy's father. Because the alethiometer <laughs> told her to. Oh, that's right. See, there's a lot that's fuzzy about this season. What's really great about his dark materials is that even though there's only been two seasons, it feels like it's been five. Yeah, it seems like there's it has been gone long. so much ground that's been covered. But on the same side, I feel like there are some draggy points mm-hmm. as well that maybe they really didn't need. I'm sad because I totally forgot that one of my favorite characters uh, gets a little maimed. Yep, sadness there. I'm not going to tell you who in case mm-hmm. you haven't read the book or seen this. I'm a little mad. However, I feel like a lot of the dead people do return in the third book for oh. reasons. Okay. Reasons. I'm that not going sense. to tell you. Um, maybe not necessarily in the same form, but they might return. Mm-hmm. Overall, generally, I think this is a, an interesting story. Especially between Lyra and... The dude. The dude. Well, I can't I remember his name. I can't name. remember his name either. I don't know. <laughs> um, now, the other thing is that this this season also introduces a new character in this physicist yes. who's been working with dark matter that turns out to be dust, which is, quote unquote, sin. But we're kind of also revealed that, no, it's not sin. It is the stuff that makes up angels. Mm-hmm. And... That she's using this I Ching, the divination sticks, to talk to them, much like Lyra uses the alethiometer. Right. 
it is definitely different than the first season, but I feel like like it's it's still good. Still like it's it. It's great world building. And I believe also what I did read was they had to cut off the end of this season as well because something happens at the end where you're like, wait, what? That was kind of abrupt and weird, but it was because they had to cut off doing because of COVID. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm going to give them a little bit of, you know, grace yeah. uh, to the ending of the season. But yeah. yeah. Some other things that we are checking out. We are probably the fifth season of The Magicians. We mm-hmm. are about halfway through. This is a very interesting season. I think it's a lot more interesting than a couple of the other seasons. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, where are they going with this? Yeah. I don't understand. The one thing that I am most happy about is that it seems like Alice is finally starting to become a little less whiny. Oh, thank goodness. Because, you know, first half of the first season, I was like, Alice, this is like, she's like my dream girl. She's such a smart person. She's a total nerd. Man, she's such a whiner. Oh my gosh, she's like such a whiner. She's ruining everybody's lives. She's such a whiner. Forget this. <laughs> Forget this. Yeah, and um, you know, this part is a tiny spoiler if you haven't seen any of the magicians. At the end of season four, they lose Quentin. And I really thought that that was going to break Alice. I was like, oh dear lord, she's going to go off the rails again. And it's going to be horrible. But she does not. It, it's great because this is a thing where loss can sometimes heal you. Mm-hmm. He was actually kind of more like her enabler. Yeah, a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the loss bit. of him forced her to deal with her own garbage. Right. But because pretty much everyone in this group, except for maybe Katie, Margot, and... Penny. Yeah. Those three people were probably the only people who didn't have some kind of a relationship with him that was very... I'm going to say intimate because I don't think he ever really got it on with Julia, but they were best friends. So those three, Julia, Elliot, and um, Alice, really were the closest to him and probably felt the loss the worst. And so I really thought that was going to go off the rails, but it, it ends up not, I don't think, right now, although Elliot's still kind of dealing with some... Other issues that don't totally have to do with Quentin. No, it's about the monster that was in him. Yeah, that was in season four. And I really feel like Margot is having a, a really rough time because she's having to wrestle with the effects of her ethics mm-hmm. on people she cares about. Right. Where before she was just kind of, I do what I want and I'm just going to get it done. Do you think that she really does love Josh? I think so. Yeah. I, I think she really does love Josh, but she doesn't want to admit it because that's admitting weakness. Correct. So we're going to leave it there until we're done with the end of Magicians and we'll step back in and see what we feel about it. But also, because we still have the CBS All Access app, we have decided we are going to plunge into The Stand. Okay, so I never saw the original version of it, and I've never read the book, but I really enjoyed The Stand because of the amount of symbolism that you're seeing all throughout, Mm -hmm. not just Revelations level stuff, but in this show, characters after this plague has wiped out everything. Ooh, hey, totally topical. Very. Uh, Even though they never planned it this way, they, uh (laughs) they didn't know that that COVID was coming. But after this plague, people start having dreams. And some people are led to this Mother Abigail, She's this old lady who lives in Colorado, and she's trying to gather up some people, and they get dreams of her in a cornfield. But other people get dreams in the Nevada desert with neon signs of their greatest wishes and a dark man who wants to grant them. And some people actually get both, and Mm -hmm. they're, they're in a war between them. They have a choice. They have a choice. And... Seeing all of these symbols in these dreams is really revelatory for what they're all about. Mm -hmm. And I love it. And I also have read that the ending to this, of the whole series, the the book itself, Mm -hmm. came because Stephen King had writer's block. He decided he was going to take a nuclear option. Mm. So, again, spoilers. The point that we just finished, the town of all the good guys just blew up. Well... Not the town. Basically a house and some surrounding areas yeah. blew up. Yes. yes, but it blew up. Which, that was him with writer's block. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to blow the whole place up. 
Yeah. See what happens. But there's still more to it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm there really is. looking forward to seeing it because this is a great, a great battle. So there are a couple things I do want to touch on while we're talking about this. The first one is that there was a lot more nudity in this than I expected. Yeah. Like I have seen the original stand, I believe, twice and I do not remember there being all of this, but, you know, it's contemporary and people feel like if they have to show debauchery, they might as well show it all. So there was a lot of this kind of like a little bit gross, a little bit, you know, sexual. If you don't like that kind of thing, you would really want to steer clear of some of these episodes because it gets real graphic. But the thing that I want to say positively about all of this is the inclusiveness that is happening mm-hmm. in terms of who they're casting. So let me let me explain a little better. In the original series, and I had totally forgotten this, but Corey was showing me pictures of the original actors who played certain roles. Mm-hmm. And I totally noticed that almost all of the actors in the original series were white Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, in this day and age, I guess I'm just more sensitive to that fact. But in this case, the diversity that they have chosen to cast people is awesome. They, I think the way they casted it was, was very, very good. Maybe my only, my only real qualm is, you know, the whole plus size part of it. Because if you watch this, you notice there's really only one plus size character and because he's the one who is tom cullen who's mm-hmm. the developmentally disabled man he's the only one who can be slightly classified as plus size really where are all the plus size women it's only been five months since the apocalypse began you're what? not losing that much weight <laughs> yeah yeah you know i mean I, I, maybe it's just me it's something that i noticed but i i feel like they were almost really great with that inclusivity but not quite yeah, especially because I, I almost feel like the the thing that defines the people that get to survive the apocalypse is that they had, although they didn't develop, the Shining. That's my theory. Mm. Because we see that Mother Abigail has the Shining. Right. And the Dark Man is somebody who's trying to take advantage of people who have that power. Right. His character is one that has shown up in a lot of stephen king's works including the dark tower and he's basically the antichrist right but he's trying to pervert people that have the shining towards his purpose Mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of what's going on here is that the the only people that survived had the shining right so we'll pop back in after we're done with this show and tell you how we think it ended up we have one more that we want to touch on very very briefly and it's a brand new show called mr mayor it Mm -hmm. is on uh, nbc slash peacock And it has Ted Danson, so you may think it's kind of like, you know, his next step after The Good Place. It is the story of a guy who became mayor of the city of L.A. And he's not very qualified for it. He's really not. And his staff is not very qualified for their positions either. Really not, no. Mm -mm. But it is pretty funny, and there is a certain, like, Parks and Rec vibe. Mm -hmm. But it is a pretty funny show, and and he has a nemesis who is someone who's been in city council. City council. City council, yeah. And so she's kind of his nemesis because she's smart, and she's environmental. And she actually does know what she's doing. She does. But she's not necessarily the nicest person. No. He is the nice person, or he tries to be the nice person, like really Mm -hmm. positive and like inclusive kind of, but in some ways they kind of hit each other. (laughs) But the the great thing is, even though they're kind of nemeses, nemesi, they actually work very well together to keep the city running in a good way. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this has Parks and Rec vibes, but it's also got some Spin City to it. It's in between the two. It's like Spin City without the laugh tracks, except you're actually laughing. Correct. Oh, I miss Spin City. I wish they still had that available because I actually really (laughs) like that show. All right, so that's all the stuff that we've been watching and we've been talking a lot. Um, The very last thing we're going to talk about is Owl Crate for this month, which is the Owl Crate for January. So this box is themed from Olympus with love. 
So it's very much a Greek gods theme. Some of the things that you get, and if you want to see the pictures, they will be on my Instagram sometime in the next week or so. You will get in here, there's a felt letter board. You know, it's kind of small. It's one of those that you can see on Instagram all the time where people like... Mm -hmm. put words on the board and then they make it as part of their flat lay i am happy for this i think it's fun it's got smileys on it so that's fun faces are good Mm -hmm. yes then there is a tapestry that is a lunar calendar for the year of 2021 yeah i mean it's very it's pretty it's very helpful if you need to keep track of the lunar calendar Mm. if you don't need to keep track of the lunar calendar it's just pretty yeah, and there is illustrations of Artemis, who is the goddess of the moon, and Athena, who is the goddess of wisdom on mm-hmm. here. They're all very pretty. Then there is something that I have been needing. Uh, I collect enamel pins, and I also collect buttons as souvenirs. And I'm starting to run out of my corkboard space for my pins. So they have included a banner that you can put the pins on. And I'm so excited for this. It's going to go in my office and I'm going to... And it's even more important because they keep on giving you enamel pins. They do. In your box, you get a a pin that is themed off of the box. So Mm -hmm. exciting. Loving that. They also have some loose leaf tea from Riddle's Tea Shop called Nectar of the Gods, which we've noticed is kind of like a peachy... Mm -hmm blend yeah uh there's a wooden bookmark and the enamel pan of course and the book this month is lore by alexander bracken i have actually read a little bit of the first chapter of this because i got like a sneak peek from net galley and then when i realized it wasn't the full book i start stopped reading yeah <laughs> so i'm excited to read this it is pretty it's a pretty interesting and hot book right now the exclusive cover that we're getting is not the best I don't think I'm not that excited for the exclusive cover, but I am excited to read the book itself. Their their exclusive covers in the past have been really interesting, but yeah, this one is just uh, oh well, it had a white background, now it has a black background. Woo. Right. But so, it, it's like when I saw it, it was still pretty. Right. So that's basically everything in that box for this month. Next month, it is going to be. It looks like the theme is Magic Unleashed. For February, it says there's going to be a book tin designed by Forensics and Flowers. I don't know what a book tin is. A book tin is a tin box that looks like a book. Awesome. So you could put other books inside your book so you can book while you book. Yeah, that's kind of fun. And then, of course, they also give you a Spotify playlist that gives you some music that is themed off of the box. So I love getting those and just kind of have background music. Mm -hmm. discovering new things Uh, but that is owl crate and again i will put the pictures on instagram that's my personal instagram zany laney but we will also be putting it on a lady geek as well so that you guys can see that so so thank you for listening to a lady geek follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast find laney on at zany laney or me at one true hazard for updates keep an eye on at elated geek on instagram or at elated geek tweets on Twitter, or go to our website at elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us continue to bring new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. You can use the same email to send us your Mario Maker 2 levels and have me show them on our YouTube channel. Until next time. Geek out.